السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته دكتور عمر It is so great uh, to see you brother Bashiru Alhamdulillah thank you very much I'm, I'm glad to to be part of the class today as well Congratulations on your Hajj Thank you very much I hope uh, everything went well Alhamdulillah um so far so good however as, as as you know as every human institution there are some challenges that we that we encountered as um Ghanaian pilgrims we have some challenges as muslim pilgrims um as a whole we also have some challenges i remember um one time you spoke about the the disease um but when you spoke about it it was it was new to me the who judge have never told me that when they come here they fall sick i thought it was isolated i never knew that um, almost everyone falls falls sick in fact that's the norm here almost everyone almost ev every pilgrim but this is something that i and uh, that I'm, i'm seeing um first hand so that is that is one one thing the, the other thing has to do with just our local organizing body that um, um there were certain things that we could have done better having observed pilgrims from other countries at a point we looked um so disorganized but of course I'm um, less silent so I hope that um so all these mistakes will not be repeated um in subsequent um years that is a uh, very true uh may allah help everyone uh, it is uh, so important to have good organization good planning good implementation yes and and in fact i was even discussing it with a colleague that hopefully um, i'm still I'm, I'm, i'm still not settled on my the, the the topic i want to work on for my phd thesis Now, this is one of the areas um, I've, I've, I think that perhaps in order to help solve some of the problems that we've seen or have observed, inshallah, uh, maybe I should, this is a possible area. So when I go, when I go home, I will speak to some of my, my uh, mentors and lecturers who have written papers on, on the way Hajj has been organized in our country. I will speak with them and I'll hopefully present my a proposal to them when 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 they okay it then i will work on it and hopefully um work on that for my phd thesis this is what i'm thinking for now i think that is wonderful and uh, makes a lot of sense and you can make a great contribution inshallah where yes. are you located now i'm i'm, I'm still in mecca um our, our pilgrims have started leaving I'm told the first flight to leave today because we are, we are we have we have about 4000 pilgrims that came with the official Hajj organizing body in my country about 4000 some came but they came on their own about 2000 came on their own and um, that's a huge figure compared to previous years and that is because of some of the challenges that they've seen with the main organizing body so the, the four, around the 4000 that came with the main organizing body um the first flight left will be leaving today so in a total we have about 78 flights so um I'm, i am i am still in maka around the dar rais area um shar sitin around the shar sitin area um that's i think about 10 minutes close to 10 minutes drive from the haram so that's where i'm currently i'm located with um the rest of ghanaian pilgrims who came with the main haj organizing body and how are you able to get from your uh, hotel to the haram so that is actually one of the challenges so right in front of the hotel there are taxis that take people to the haram and i never knew this until i got here that even v8 v8 cars which are luxury cars in my country are being used as taxis here <laughs> anyway so it's not difficult to get a car right in front of the hotel you can get a taxi 
but just about some two minutes walk from the hotel to the to the to the to the highway is is a bus a government bus which conveys pilgrims to the haram free of charge um the the the, the, the challenge is the the private cars do charge exorbitant prices they charge exorbitant prices you know they are supposed to charge about five between five to ten reals per pilgrim but sometimes they charge about 50 reals in fact we met a taxi driver who was ready to charge us 100 reals and that was too much and the day we did the jamarat uh, uh the last jamarat on our way back one of our colleagues fell sick so our intention was to walk from our tent in mina to do the final jamarat then um, go to the haram to do atwaf al ifada then come home to the hotel this was i think the third day now we walked we did our jamarat as we were walking to the haram we realized he wasn't feeling well we got close to the haram but then we decided to postpone our tawaf al ifada to the following day we we took a taxi to our hotel and the man charged us 500 riyals 500 and all of us felt no this was too much but because we had a sick person among us in fact it was this sick colleague who eventually paid the money because he was struggling and and it was just too much so this is one of the observations that that i observe the, the rate at which some of these drivers are charging some of the pilgrims so since then i have not used any of the private um, taxis to the haram i use the bus the problem with the bus too is that it delays. Sometimes you spend about 30, a journey that will take about 10 minutes, will take about 30, 40, even one hour before you get to the Haram because every bus stop, the bus has to stop and pick, um, getting more, more pilgrims. So this has been the challenge so far. May Allah help you and all the pilgrims and everyone who uh, visits the Haram uh, with all the challenges, inshallah. Is there a direct flight from uh, Jeddah to uh, Accra? Okay, so actually there is no direct flight, but because we came with the main hard organizing body, the flights are all chartered flights. So directly from Jeddah, we go straight to Accra because it's a chartered flight. But those who came on their own have to either do a transit in Egypt or in Ethiopia. So just like this sick, sick colleague that I told you about, he left um, yesterday and he arrived in Ghana somewhere this afternoon, the local time. So he did a transit in Ethiopia, and he he's he's now in Ghana. Of course, work schedules they were giving him pressure at the workplace, so he had to he did not wait for his schedule. So he um, got his own ticket and he left. But for me, interestingly, I'm enjoying the environment, and, and <laughs> even though I miss home, I don't want to go home. I wish I could spend I could spend additional four five months, uh, partly because it will help me better my speaking Arabic speaking skills. I feel this opportunity and also get benefits from the haram. You know, when you go home, you don't get opportunities like this again. <laughs> Absolutely. Our uh, hearts and spirits get connected to the holy places, and it is truly a blessing to be there and to have the chance to spend time there. Uh, Daniar, salamu alaikum. Let me begin by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I greet you in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Uh, welcome to class number four. Today is Sunday, 9 July 2023, and the class is ITKI 6204, Sociology of Religion and Culture. We are in the summer trimester 2023, which is from June to August 2023, sponsored by IKI Academy. And I am your instructor, Mar Al Talib. Uh, I am uh, very happy to be with you and to 
uh, share uh, what little knowledge that I have uh, with uh, all of you uh, and to learn from all of you at uh, the same time. Today, as we know, uh, we are uh, having had uh, Eid al-Adha celebration uh, already and also uh, our sisters and brothers uh, have uh, performed Hajj in uh, Mecca uh, and uh, many of them also uh, visited Medina. So we congratulate all those sisters and brothers who have had a chance to go to uh, Mecca and Medina and perform the Hajj rituals and to visit uh, the uh, grave of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his mosque in Medina and Medina al Munawwara, uh, the great city of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we also uh, pray and uh, ask Allah to assist all of us and uh, the people in the Ummah who have not yet performed Hajj to perform this great and holy ritual that is one of the five pillars of Islam as soon as possible and with ease and comfort and without any difficulties. Uh, I was just speaking with uh, our dear brother Bashir Muhammad, uh, who has just uh, performed the Hajj uh, ritual, uh, and uh, it is uh, with uh, great uh, happiness uh, and with uh, great uh, support that we uh, are congratulating our brother Bashiru, uh, who uh, has uh, just completed. Uh, the Hajj ritual, uh, and uh, if we can all say congratulations to Brother Bashiru, who is now in Mecca, uh, we uh, we congratulate you, Brother Bashiru Muhammad, and we uh, ask Allah to bless uh, your Hajj uh, and to uh, give you a great reward and success in this life and the hereafter. Congratulations, Brother Bashiru. Uh, you're welcome. And also, uh, have any of you, the rest of you, uh, do you know anybody from your uh, family or friends or community who has performed Hajj this year? Hajj Mubarak, yes, uh, uh, and Hajj Mabrur. Do yes. any of you know of anybody in uh, your circle? Yes, 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 yes. yes. I, I, I just, I, I have about, uh, let me see, how many of them? There are more than two. But one just arrived yesterday. So she she called me this morning and I went to visit her at her home. And she what we discussed yesterday about the situation of Hajj, she also mentioned it that it was a hellfire. I don't want to say hellfire for them, but it was very hectic. The 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 the, the experience was very terrible, was very bad. That is, they were not well catered for. They suffered a lot. You know, the temperature was not favorable. The condition was very, the, the weather, Mecca's weather was very harsh. To the extent that person said in Nigeria, we are just in Algeria. <laughs> in Nigeria is very, Nigeria, Nigeria, one of the one of the best weather in the world, Nigeria has that weather. Right now we are experiencing rain. You know, this morning it rains, yesterday it also rained. You understand? So she said that, uh, uh, when she wanted to go and throw the pebbles at uh, Jamra, she she uh, she uh, put up the ashu, and she wore two socks, and uh, her two feet the, the her two feet were almost born as a result of extreme heat. To the extent she got to a particular stage, she has to sit down because she couldn't go anywhere. When the soldier, when the police there, when they saw her, they rallied around her and they started pouring water on her. She said she was able to, to, to come back to normal something after a lot of water had been poured on her. So, and then the other one, she is still in Niger right now, but he, he told me that uh, he experienced, he said the experience was not uh, 
was not a good one. It was not a good one. That is, uh, they, they uh, concluded the Hajj ritual June 30. Up to now, they are still in Mecca. They were waiting for when they will be lived, uh, when they are going to be airlifted. And uh, no money again, no anything. So how is he going to survive? So before I came to the class, or around 2, uh, 2, 2 p.m., I got his uh, WhatsApp message saying that uh, that airlifting started was just only one state in, in Nigeria that was airlifted. So uh, the experience there, to the extent that somebody will now be thinking that, what do I need to go to Hajj? <laughs> If I, have, if I have to go through this hell. And I said that this is what we discussed in our class yesterday, that we were, my lecturer was saying that, why can't we use a jihad instead of uh, performing Hajj in the month of the uh, Hijjah alone? Why can't we spread it? One Quran has said, Ashuru Ma'alumat. How can some people uh, 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 observe it in Shawal, the Qaeda, and the Hijjah? So that it's going to give the people, the Saudi authority, it will give them adequate uh, opportunity to make adequate preparation and to make sure that all the, all the pilgrims, they were treated very well and they, they, they gave them and they, 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 they will give them uh, uh, necessary attention. So based on what we discussed in the class, so Alhamdulillah, she gave me Semzem water as well as uh, Adwa. <laughs> so and I ate you and I, I drank uh, Zem Zem. <laughs> and I don't really like that was a feeling. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Bashir, for that contribution. Uh, but Brother Bashir, please. Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much for, for the congratulatory messages. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, may Allah accept all our du'as. Um, for me, um, I listen to um, my, my um, brother Bashir, my senior brother from Nigeria, um, as he gave his comments. And so sorry. Alhamdulillah, I had friends from Nigeria, so I had the opportunity of visiting one of the Nigerian tents in Mina. Um, I, I went to the place and saw the challenges that I saw um, with my Ghanaian um, Brothers, I saw it there as well. And earlier when I was discussing some of the challenges with you, um, Dr. Umar, I believe that these are areas that that we can we can work to make uh, these things better. There are so many improvements that have um, that have happened relative to what used to happen previously. And and I think as we see these problems. Um, perhaps on our side, we can think of solutions and see how best we can propose those solutions so some of these challenges can be solved. Previously, I was told by one of my te teachers that when he did Hajj, the day of the sacrifice, that when you go to uh, where the sacrifice is done, you will not be happy at what you will see. Because, you know, so many people are sacrificing their animals and they are leaving the animals. You know, they just leave the animals. The animals rot and, and are just there. But now changes have, have, have happened. And I, I, even though I did the sacrifice, I did not see the animal because it is now well regulated. So this is a clear example of um, you know, a previous problem which existed and that problem has now been solved. Having said that, Marcus weather is so, so unfriendly. Like <laughs> on the day of Arafa, my phone nearly went off. Like my phone nearly went off due, due to the due to the temperature, and we were we were and for the first time tents were introduced in Arafa. So we had a tent in Arafa that had air condition, so we didn't have to feel the heat of Arafa. But as young people, we decided to leave the tent and go stand in the sun just so we could have a feel of what Arafa used to be like. But the elderly were discouraged from going out. The elderly were asked not to leave. So this is one of the challenges that came. So when I left the tent and I stood close to the mountain, I understood what our predecessors went through. Because the water I had on me, I, had, I went there with a, a number of colleagues, about four of us. Within an hour, we exhausted all the water we had. And now we had to rely on other people to give us their water. They also exhausted their water. 
and we saw one man who had about four bottles of water and who refused to give the water out because he knew that once he gave the water out, he will also be struggling for water. Eventually, we had to leave and go back to the tent. But this gave us an idea of what our predecessors went through standing at Arafat and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the companions went through. So, so um, we were young. I was just imagining had, had the elderly come out what the weather would have done. So when you, uh, when Brother Bashir tell us about, you know, the experience of the person he visited, I can understand. I can understand what the person went through. Mecca's weather is so, so unfriendly. You know, and, and one thing which I said, Arafa, for me, the tape old message for this year's Hajj, I had it at Muzdalifa. You know, Muzdalifa just stood out for me. Because we didn't have mattresses at Muzdalifa, we had to sleep on mats on the background. And all of us were just, you know, brought to the low. You know, there is one ruler from my country who came to the Hajj. You know, I saw him at Arafa. And was looking like a normal person. You wouldn't have known that this was a ruler. I do not know him. I knew he was he was a ruler, he was a chief because I knew him. Like I, I, I know him. So when I saw him, I was like, wow. So this chief is part of us. And he was looking so ordinary. Nothing showed that he was a ruler. And this person had to sleep on the background at Muzalifa. You know, and so for me, Muzalifa really stood out. And the following day after Muzalifa, we had to walk and go do our first Jamarat. And so some of these things stood out for me. So even though, you know, Marcus Wada is very unfriendly, I think the lessons were, were well learned. For me, as a young person coming up, you know, I, I thank Allah for having gone through this and to have learned the lesson. And I will encourage that whosoever has the means should try to undertake this journey. But the person should discourage the older generation. For the older generation, I don't, I don't suggest this. I won't suggest this for the older generation. For me, I won't suggest this for the older generation. The slot that I had, I nearly gave it to my dad. I had wanted my dad to come perform the hard on my behalf. But when I came here, I realized that it was good that I left him back home. Because it was a decision I took with him, and he was like, no, I should come perform it. Like, when I came here, I, I, I understood why I had to come, rather than he coming. Because it would have been, I've seen a lot of people collapse from among the elder, elder generation. And that is because the, the, the terrain is so, so difficult to deal with. So this is just what I wanted to add. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for this great contribution. Uh, from Mecca, Al Mukarama, uh, you and your uh, fellow Hajjis uh, have been blessed with this uh, great gift of having been able to perform Hajj. And we uh, wish for all of us and our Ummah, for those who uh, have not yet performed the Hajj, to be able to be blessed with this uh, great and wonderful gift, uh, an amazing and unique. Uh, and uh, top spiritual experience uh, that is unlike any other experience for any human being uh, on earth. Uh, the Hajj is uh, a, a, an incredible gift, uh, a miracle from our Creator, from Allah, to uh, humanity, to the Hajjis, uh, that they are able uh, to go through the uh, most spiritual and most humbling experience uh, and it's fascinating uh, also from the point of view of sociology because Hajj is what is called a leveling experience uh, same thing with Umrah uh, where everybody is wearing the same clothes and going through the same activities in the same place so uh, rich and poor there is no difference between them tall and short, uh, large and small, uh, <clears throat> educated and uneducated, uh, all kinds of uh, men and women are coming together uh, as one, uh, performing a, uh, an amazing uh, ritual, uh, a great and blessed event that will stay with them uh, for the rest of their lives. 
And in addition to the uh, sociological aspect of it being a leveling experience of bringing together rich and poor on the same level, uh, it is also significant socially uh, because in many or all Muslim cultures, once you have performed the Hajj, then uh, you have a new title, which uh, now you are, if you are a woman, you are called Hajjia or Hajja, uh, and if you are a man, you are called uh, Hajji or Hajj. Uh, and so, so this is a social distinction that stays with you for the rest of your life. Hajj is uh, a religious achievement. It is also a, a social achievement. It is a spiritual achievement, renewing you and your spirit and your innate relationship to Allah and erasing your sins and opening up a new chapter in your life. But also on the social level, you have become uh, somebody else. Uh, you are a transformed human being who can then spread uh, the spirituality and the humility and the lessons of Hajj with others in your villages and cities and communities uh, and countries and nations uh, all over the world. Uh, it used to be, at least uh, in many Muslim cultures, that before a person went on Hajj, there were ceremonies to show uh, appreciation from uh, the people, from the Muslims uh, around him or her, uh, and they are given a kind of farewell uh, experience. Uh, and then uh, when uh, the uh, Hajjah or the Hajji, when the uh, Muslim pilgrim uh, returns, men and women, uh, then uh, they are also welcomed with ceremonies and feasts uh, and given uh, an amazing uh, greeting. Uh, it is sad to say that this uh, appreciation and celebration of those who performed Hajj is dying out uh, throughout the Ummah. Uh, it may still continue in some of your communities, but I know that uh, in, in Mosul, Iraq, uh, less and less people uh, are engaging in this farewell ritual for those going to Hajj and then welcoming back uh, ritual for uh, those who uh, have successfully completed the Hajj uh, and have arrived home and are welcome and as recognized as transformed uh, people in the community. At the same time, we have to realize that uh, in every religion, particularly in Islam, you have the ritual and the greatness of the ritual and the significance of the ritual and the amazing blessings and the miracle uh, of the ritual of Hajj. Uh, but there are also uh, things uh, that are challenges, uh, that are difficulties, uh, that are setbacks, uh, that are uh, human-related uh, conditions uh, that affect the experience of Hajj. Uh, and uh, our dear brothers, uh, Dr. Uh, Bashir and Brother uh, Bashiru, were pointing out some of them. Uh, and so this is where we uh, go back to uh, the principles that we had mentioned in class about Ihsan and Itqan, excellence and improvement. There is always room for improvement and uh, trying to achieve excellence in everything, including one of the most important rituals in Islam, which is the Hajj. And the Saudi authorities have spent billions uh, trying to make things uh, better uh, and uh, providing all kinds of services uh, and police uh, supervision and uh, water distribution uh, and uh, creating uh, better uh, <coughs> roadways uh, and uh, tunnels. Uh, but there is so much more uh, that needs to be done that can be done. But there's also a big responsibility on the uh, groups that are bringing the hajjis, uh, bringing the pilgrims from uh, countries around the world. There is a, a, a tremendous responsibility having to do with many aspects like transportation uh, and uh, lodging uh, and food and water and health care uh, and uh, protection. Uh, especially as both of you were saying, for the elderly, for the weak, for the handicapped. Uh, more and more countries around the world uh, are recognizing uh, the necessity 
of taking into account the needs of the handicapped, of people who cannot walk, people who cannot see, people who cannot hear, uh, people who cannot speak, all kinds of uh, conditions uh, that Muslims have uh, that need to be accommodated as much as possible, especially during rituals uh, like Hajj. Uh, furthermore, uh, there is a, a need to address uh, issues of uh, the heat, uh, which can be deadly. Uh, and uh, every year or few years, people die uh, from heat stroke, uh, from uh, the uh, strong sun, uh, from the uh, lack of uh, shelter or dehydration. <clears throat> and this is something that is very serious. Uh, other than uh, other human issues like uh, one or more stampedes that have occurred in the past where people suddenly start rushing uh, for some reason and people get stepped on uh, and killed uh, because of a stampede, uh, which has happened in past years. Uh, and also fire. Uh, fire has caused uh, many, many deaths uh, of hajjis in uh, previous years that might be caused by uh, negligence or uh, the use of un, uh, uh, illegal stoves uh, or uh, heating devices inside tents, uh, which uh, should not be happening, uh, or even using tent material uh, that is liable to uh, burning rather than being fire retardant. Uh, and that emphasizes also the importance of the uh, fire services uh, and the medical services, the ambulance services, uh, which are a constant need and necessity uh, throughout uh, Hajj uh, as well as throughout uh, the rest of the year. So when we discuss uh, sociology of religion and culture, uh, in terms of religion, uh, there is a distinction to be made between the religion itself and then the followers of the religion. So the religion, which can be found in the holy books, in the case of Islam, it is the Quran, and in the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and in the uh, actions of the companions or those who came after them, uh, and the uh, teachings of the scholars, so that is the religion. Now that is a separate thing from the people, Muslims, who follow Islam, who follow the religion. It's two dis distinct things, two separate things. What religion says, Muslims might follow or not follow. And what Muslims do may be Islam or a deviation or misinterpretation of Islam. So for example, uh, as many people point out, Islam is a religion of peace, and yet some Muslims become terrorists and killers uh, and uh, people who uh, commit uh, horrible, barbaric acts in the name of Islam, whether it is Taliban or whether it is Al-Qaeda or whether it is Daesh or ISIS or Boko Haram or other so-called uh, Muslim uh, terrorist groups. So they claim to be following Islam, but in reality, they are violating Islam. So just because somebody says, I am a Muslim, does not automatically translate into uh, their true, complete, uh, and uh, consistent following of Islam. Now, scholars around the world address this in different ways. So some might say there is a pure Islam, and then people might follow pure Islam or deviations. Others, others characterize it as there are Islams, multiple forms of Islam, and people follow different forms of Islam. Uh, any way you want to characterize it is simply a human characterization, a human description, a human way of looking at things, which may be right or wrong, which may be uh, fallible or uh, correct, uh, which may be uh, closer to the truth or uh, further away from the truth. So it is essential uh, that regardless, uh, we should read all of these scholars and books uh, and claims, of course, uh, to understand more, but we should also be aware uh, that uh, the single most agreed upon 
uh, item in uh, the Islamic faith in the Muslim religion is the Quran. This is what is agreed upon. This is the starting point. Uh, this is the basis. This is the foundation. Once you uh, establish the Quran as the foundation, whether as a believer or a scholar, uh, then there is a logic, uh, a consistency, uh, a, a way of uh, speaking and performing and following uh, that has a solid basis. So uh, that is why uh, one of the things I emphasize in my classes is that between us and uh, others around the world, uh, there are things we disagree upon and there are things we agree upon. But when we are discussing Islam, we should, before starting any discussion, agree upon do we all uh, have a, a common acceptance and agreement that uh, the basis is the Qur'an. Uh, uh, we begin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who then uh, revealed the Qur'an. Uh, of course, there are things that have to do with the Creator that precede the Qur'an which is what we uh, categorize under uh, the uh, umbrella of Tawheed. So we have uh, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed al-Asma' wa-Sifat, which are Arabic terms for uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, a, a creator exists, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, and then this creator is one, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and then uh, this creator has uh, eternal characteristics uh, has names and uh, descriptors so we call that in Arabic Tawheed al-Asma' wa sifat so as long as we can agree that there is a creator there is only one creator this creator has characteristics and then derive from that that the creator has revealed the Quran and then the Quran becomes the basis for uh, our decisions about uh, the uh, ibadat, the rituals and the mu'amalat, uh, the interactions. So that forms uh, the uh, uh, the way to start understanding Islam that is independent of who is the scholar or the uh, student or the discusser or uh, those who are involved in the discussion. And then we can have uh, our uh, thoughts and uh, feelings uh, and our comments. So. Uh, when I brought up the topic of Hajj, we can agree uh, that Hajj is established by Allah in the Quran as a uh, required uh, Muslim uh, ritual. That we can agree upon. Uh, oh, Aisha is having trouble with uh, the network. We hope it is uh, corrected soon. The ritual is there, it is established in the Qur'an, it is uh, a commandment from Allah. But implementation of this ritual, that becomes a human affair. So we have the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about how it's done. Uh, but then, uh, we, at the same time, uh, we are uh, dealing with human beings. We are not dealing with angels, we are not dealing with devils. We are dealing with human beings in the millions coming to the same place at the same time to perform the rituals of Hajj. Many Muslim human beings do things in a better way. Uh, many do not. Uh, many uh, Muslim human beings uh, know what to do and how to do it in the most proper way or uh, in, uh, in a, uh, a way that is productive. Uh, and many uh, do not. So <clears throat> uh, when we talk about disease, for example, as was brought up, uh, illness, uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is uh, it is a requirement for Hajj for you to be healthy before you go. Uh, but not everybody may uh, adhere to this rule. Uh, it is requirement for Hajj for you to have enough money, not just to get there, but enough money to spend while you are there and enough money uh, to get back. Uh, most uh, Muslims uh, are uh, following this requirement, but some do not, uh, and simply uh, find some ways to uh, barely make it through 
or rely on the handouts of others. Uh, and what you see in Mecca uh, is uh, there are beggars. Uh, now, uh, are these uh, people Hajjis or residents of Mecca or from elsewhere? Uh, I don't have, and many of us do not have those statistics uh, and that reality. But the fact that there are people uh, begging in Mecca raises a lot of questions and concerns. How on earth uh, in the most holiest city of Islam, uh, the place that is the most blessed place on earth, uh, can there be people who claim uh, that they are dying of hunger or uh, do not have uh, enough to survive? Uh, some may be telling the truth, uh, some may not. Uh, and, and this is uh, one of the issues. Uh, at the same time, uh, in Mecca during Hajj and other seasons, there are thieves. There are people who steal. Now, they may be a very tiny, small minority, but they exist. And uh, they are a problem for everybody, uh, and uh, they are uh, <clears throat> being uh, addressed by the uh, Saudi authorities, by the police, by the National Guard, but they still come every year. And they, deprived, they deprive Hajjis, many of them poor Hajjis, of their uh, money. A lot of Hajjis, as you know, are carrying money in a, in a satchel or a bag or a purse uh, on their body. Uh, whether male or female, uh, and these thieves find ways to uh, get the money out or cut the purse or the uh, satchel or the bag uh, and take away uh, absolutely necessary resources uh, that are uh, being used by the people performing the Hajj. And so uh, it is legitimate to ask, how can this ritual, this great blessing, this incredibly important uh, part of the Muslim faith uh, be uh, a location where uh, a tragedy can occur uh, health-wise and also uh, crime-wise. It should be the safest place on earth. In theory, it should be the safest place on earth. In reality, it might not be for everybody uh, and for all time. Uh, also, you have uh, you know the pathways where people walk sometimes they are very clean and very organized and very safe and very level but sometimes there is construction or some old uh, <coughs> uh, roads or uh, places without pavement that are dangerous for walking especially at night where you don't see uh, these uh, dangers or you don't recognize them uh, until it is too late, and so many people get hurt that way. This is a human issue. Uh, this is something that uh, all of us need to be uh, concerned about uh, and worried about and trying to find solutions. Now, among Muslims, you have different uh, kinds of attitudes. So one attitude uh, is referred to as fatalism. What is fatalism? Fatalism is the attitude that says, yes, there are problems, but there's nothing I can do about it, and whatever happens, happens, and if it happens, it's because Allah wanted it to happen, uh, and, and, and that's the end of that. Where do you see this manifesting itself? It manifests or it shows up in different ways. For example, I've had many discussions with uh, many uh, friends, Muslim friends, uh, let's say some of my friends from Iraq. We are in a car, uh, I put on the seat belt, uh, and he or she, they do not put on the seat belt. And I would say to them, uh, we are going by car. Anything can happen. Uh, it is important to be safe. You are not uh, putting on your seat belt. And their answer would be, oh, if God wanted me to die, I'm going to die anyway, whether there's a seat belt or not. Okay? Uh, you may have heard this kind of attitude show up in different uh, ways, shapes, and forms. Okay, so uh, the question becomes, is this an Islamic attitude to say, oh, I don't have to be safe, I don't have to follow the rules and guidelines, uh, I don't have to worry about uh, uh, taking care of uh, the uh, issues that will uh, uh, create a safe environment, because whatever God has already decided, that's it, 
uh, I'm not in a position to change God's will. Okay? Uh, I don't know how many of you have, have come across uh, this type of attitude, but it exists throughout not just the Muslim world, even non-Muslims, but particularly Muslims, I have noticed, uh, have exhibited this uh, issue. So uh, the other uh, 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 the other side of it is to say, wait a minute, Allah did not say be reckless, be uh, inconsiderate, uh, be unsafe, and then somehow uh, this is the way to run your life. There is nothing in the Quran uh, that supports fatalism. In fact, the Quran requires you to think, to contemplate. Uh, to study, to learn. And part of the requirements of a Muslim, according to my understanding of the Qur'an and many of the scholars that we are discussing here, is uh, Allah requires you uh, to take care of your uh, your amanat, uh, your <clears throat> the things you are responsible for. And your body, your life is, is a blessing, is a gift, uh, is a... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a great uh, uh, matter uh, that has been uh, given to you uh, as uh, as a trust. We are entrusted with this body, and part of that trust is uh, is the responsibility to take care of our body. So, uh, for a person to say that, oh, uh, I don't have to eat uh, healthy food. Uh, I'll just eat whatever, and whenever God has already decided I will die, I will die anyway, regardless of whether I eat healthy food or unhealthy food. Uh, this, uh, in my uh, humble understanding, is not Islam. Islam says, do what is best, and the Quran says, eat what is healthy. The good things of what we have uh, provided you with. Uh, and so uh, the attitude of fatalism is actually uh, contradictory to uh, the Muslim perspective as I understand it. Uh, uh, but it exists all over the uh, Muslim world. Uh, furthermore, you have the issue of uh, dealing with uh, the uh, religious uh, aspects uh, of these big gatherings. So you have a large social gathering. Hajj is one of the largest gatherings of people on earth. Uh, it is not the largest, but it is one of the largest. So how do people treat each other? Here is where culture comes in. In order for Hajj to be successful, everybody has to cooperate, has to be kind, has to be generous, uh, has to be patient, uh, has to be uh, in possessing attitudes uh, of humility and respect uh, and uh, <clears throat> working together. However, what you do see, unfortunately, at Hajj, and this can also happen uh, in Umrah during uh, busy times, especially during Ramadan, is there is pushing and shoving. Somebody pushes you from the back or somebody from the side comes and uh, with their strength uh, they shove you uh, to the right or the left. So this pushing and shoving, it's not in the Quran, it's not allowed. The Prophet never did it. He never pushed or shoved anybody even when he was angry. A lot of Muslims do not practice this, but some Muslims, and I am speaking from personal experience, and I'm sure you've had your own experience, uh, some Muslims are very organized and they are respectful and they uh, don't hurt you or bother you. But some Muslims, they engage in pushing and shoving. Uh, and sometimes it is so serious that you really get hurt or you might even fall down and then get trampled upon, people start walking over you. And it becomes an issue that is even worse when it is done in the name of Islam. So for example, the Kaaba is a square structure. 
it has a cloth that covers it, and in one corner is the uh, Hajar al-Aswad, uh, the black rock, a meteorite that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that our creator had instructed for it to be placed in uh, one corner of the Kaaba, one edge. Many Muslims, they make dua after passing or during, while passing the black rock. Some people insist on going and kissing the black rock under the uh, understanding that this will give them extra blessings from Allah. Although this is controversial, uh, and uh, it, is, it is not a requirement. Uh, you can you, you do the seven uh, times going around the Kaaba, uh, the Tawaf. Uh, nowhere does it say it is required to go kiss the black stone, but some Muslims insist on kissing the black stone. So what's the problem? Well, if nobody is at the Kaaba, fine, you go and kiss the, ka the the black stone. But if there are hundreds or thousands or millions of people, how are you going to kiss the black stone? There's people in front of you and behind you and all around you. So, so you are going this way, but the black stone is here, so you have to go this way. You have to go against the traffic, against the people making tawaf. And so this is where some Muslims, I am very sorry to say, they will push and they will shove in order to do something like going to the black stone. And the question becomes, your faith is based upon peace and dignity and respect uh, and support uh, as Islam teaches us, and yet they are engaging in something very hurtful uh, and very dangerous, <laughs> extremely dangerous. So, how can they justify in the face of Allah on the Day of Judgment that uh, they have hurt other Muslims, hurt other people, uh, men and women, young and old, weak and strong, in order to justify an act that is not required? How can they stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment and explain this? And here is where we get uh, the contradictions between religion and culture. Religion says, be respectful, be careful, uh, be helpful, be dignified, uh, be focused on humility and support and cooperation. This is what the religion is saying. But either for psychological or cultural reasons, people are willing to push and shove. And it's not just the, for the Black Stone. In, in other uh, events as well, as such as the throwing of the uh, rocks at the devil, Rami uh, al-Jamarat, you see this phenomenon as well. Uh, and in other contexts. So this is a religious context, but it also happens in non-religious contexts. Uh, in addition to pushing and shoving, the issue of uh, standing in line, waiting in line. Uh, so you have an event or an activity such as uh, waiting to enter uh, the mosque, the masjid, the haram makki, or the haram al-madari. When it is uh, quiet, not many people, the doors are open, you enter. But when there are hundreds or thousands or millions of people all trying to get in at the same time, what happens? One option is to line up, be in a straight line, wait for the person in front of you. People go in one by one uh, with respect, with dignity, with humility. The other scenario is everybody wants to get in at the same time. So it is uh, like a mob. It is like a uh, uncontrolled herd. Uh, it is like a uh, what in English is called a free for all. Just everybody get trying to go in at the same time. There's no line. There's no organization. Uh, there's no respect for uh, the other people around you. Does this happen? Yes, it does. Do Muslims do it? Unfortunately, sometimes they do. Does it happen in the holiest places on earth for Muslims? Yes, it does. And so here, 
we are confronted with what the religion teaches, organization, dignity, respect, uh, consideration, humility, and what is actually happening, which is chaos, which is uh, wanting to get in before others, uh, which is uh, extreme, uh, unregulated uh, egoism, uh, which is a willingness to hurt others so that you can be first or ahead or in front or get in uh, first. How do we, first of all, describe this? And then how do we understand this? But most importantly, how do we solve this? This is not limited to Muslims. It happens in cultures around the world. However, the more so-called advanced or civilized areas, uh, you see this a lot less. So uh, when I was growing up in the United States, it was very clear that everybody, when uh, there is a line, you respect the line and you stand in line, whether it is at the airport, whether it is uh, waiting for a toilet, whether it is uh, <clears throat> going to uh, buy something. Uh, the, uh, the, the proper behavior is uh, standing in line. Now, when I go to the Middle East, unfortunately, uh, I frequently see sometimes people are standing in line and sometimes not. It's just chaos and uh, confusion. It also happens in Western countries, but much less. I'm just talking about relative uh, numbers here. So uh, the, the more modern countries tend to be more uh, respectful of the line. Other countries, maybe not so much. And so we have this situation. We have a contradiction between religion, which says respect the line, and culture, which for some reason is uh, not uh, in accordance with that. So from a sociology point of, of view, we look at how children are brought up. Are they brought up to be people who stand in line and have patience and have respect? Or are they brought up differently? And I'm not criticizing here. I'm not saying uh, who is going to heaven or hell. Uh, just from a scholarly perspective, uh, it's fascinating to look at the cultural differences, uh, the social differences, and to try to not just understand it, but explain it. Where is this coming from? And then if we want to find a solution, then we have to look at how we bring up our children, what we reinforce in society uh, and uh, the uh, the norms, what are called in sociology the norms. You look at driving, for example. In, in Europe, when I drive a car in North America, uh, there's uh, a road and then there's lines in the road and the car stays more or less within the lines of the road uh, and there's a speed limit and then if you want to change the lanes, you wait for the cars go ahead and then you go behind them respectfully, right? There's some organization, some uh, proper uh, behavior for driving. I go to other countries and it's a disaster. It's a nightmare. Nobody is respecting the lines. Everybody's all over the place. And then if they make, a, make want to make a left turn and studying the, of being in the left turn lane, they go all the way from the right turn lane uh, and they try to cut in front. So this idea of uh, while driving, trying to cut in front, or while in line, trying to cut in front, I've seen it all over the world. But particularly, especially in Muslim countries, I have seen it. Uh, driving in Mecca is like suicide, as Brother Bashiro has pointed out. Yes, uh, and uh, I have uh, ridden in cars, even in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, the capital, uh, it's still uh, very problematic. In Jeddah, it's much more organized. And they have put cameras, uh, uh, and they, they catch people who are speeding or who are uh, driving incorrectly. Uh, so Jeddah is much better than Riyadh uh, and Mecca. Uh, and so, so it can be changed, uh, but it takes time. Uh, and it cannot be done through religious commands. So even if the imam in the masjid stands up and says it is haram to drive 
improperly. It is haram to cut in front of other people. Uh, it is haram to uh, wa uh, go wavering between the lanes instead of staying in your lane. It doesn't mean that will change people. And here is a misconception that some Muslims might have. The misconception is that all you have to do is tell people that this is required by Islam and that's going to change them by itself. The reality is uh, not uh, that way. The reality is people grow up with a particular culture and religion may or may not change it. And it certainly does not change by making it a command uh, from an imam or from a religious figure. That's not what changes people. What really changes people is education, uh, is training, is, is social uh, uh, development. Uh, and these are all long term. It doesn't happen in one week or one month. Uh, some people say, well, you just make a law and people will change. Making a law, making it uh, a crime to violate certain uh, misbehaviors does not mean people will immediately follow the law. Excuse me, the law. The law is based on force. It's based upon power. Uh, it's based upon tyranny. Whereas proper behavior should not be based upon the law. So according to the Muslim or one of the Muslim perspectives, what is proper behavior based upon? And if you listen to many scholars, they will tell you proper behavior should base, be based upon, first and foremost, pleasing the Creator, getting the Creator to accept your behavior uh, and to uh, reciprocate the love. So you should be doing things because you love Allah, because you love the Creator, because you want to make the Creator happy, because you want to follow the wonderful rules uh, uh, and laws of the Creator. And then that gets translated into your conscience. So your conscience tells you what is good and bad. So you try to follow what is good and you uh, try to avoid what is bad because we have a conscience. And then we want to make sure that we fulfill our obligations to others, to our parents, uh, to our elders, to our community, to our society. So all this translates into proper behavior. But it doesn't come from nowhere. We are not born knowing proper behavior. Somebody has to teach us, instill it in us, put it in our mind and our conscience. It should be part of our thinking and part of our feeling. If this does not happen, then what you will see is improper behavior. Uh, not respecting the line, driving uh, uh, improperly, uh, and uh, pushing and shoving uh, other people. This becomes a culture uh, that is a culture based upon violence, based upon thinking you are better than others, above others, uh, an uh, attitude of arrogance rather than a humility, uh, and a willingness to do anything it takes to put yourself ahead and everybody else behind. So one of the reasons that uh, scholars, when they look at the Qur'an, there's a huge emphasis in the Qur'an on humility and a description of arrogance as a huge sin. You will see this, uh, and I encourage you to reread the Quran and look for humility and arrogance and what the Quran says. And the Quran consistently shows in many different contexts the uh, <coughs> goodness of humility and the sin and the despicable nature, the bad uh, aspects of arrogance. One of the worst things a human being can have is arrogance. Why? Because it is arrogance that leads to rejection of Allah, that, reads, that leads to a denial of the Creator, uh, that leads to deviant behavior, that leads to crime, that leads to pushing and shoving, uh, that leads to uh, chaos rather than standing in line, that leads to putting yourself in front of everybody else and trying to get in before everybody else. Uh, and it leads to this uh, improper driving behavior, thinking you're uh, more important than anybody else, or you own the road, or, or you are superior. 
all this is connected to arrogance to thinking you are better or more important or above uh, very clearly it is in the story of uh, Fir'aun of the pharaohs of Egypt they were so arrogant they became so arrogant they had so much power so much money so much control they thought they were gods Astaghfirullah. so they thought they were supreme beings that they were the same or in place of Allah you see this is where arrogance will lead you to think that you are number one in everything in every way in every way shape and form and this is how we get dictatorships whether it was the tyranny uh, the the volm, the injustice the taghut the tyrant of the past like the tyrants of uh, mesopotamia of iraq at the time of uh, babylonia and uh, assyrian civilization uh, and Akkadian civilization, they did many good things, but their leaders were ta'ud, they were tyrants. Uh, same thing with ancient Persian civilization, uh, ancient Chinese civilization, ancient Greek civilization, uh, ancient Roman civilization. Uh, Greek and Roman civilization were very interesting because Greeks had something like a democracy where people voted, so the tyranny was restricted. The Romans established something called a republic, where uh, the uh, the citizens, of course, not everybody could be a citizen. Only uh, Romans from a certain class could be citizens, landowners, uh, and uh, those who uh, were belonging to uh, the people uh, who were considered citizens. They would uh, elect representatives, and these representatives form an assembly, uh, and they controlled the tyrant or limited the tyrant or uh, decided who will be uh, the the Kaisar, the, the Caesar, the leader of Rome. So it was still uh, types of tyranny, but much less uh, of, of parut, of, uh, of oppression and uh, of uh, uh, systems of uh, absolute control. But then it reappears throughout history. So then you get people like Hitler uh, in Nazi Germany, Stalin and Lenin. Uh, in the Soviet Union, in, in Russia, uh, and you get uh, the emperors of China, the emperors of Japan, uh, and uh, the sultans of Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, the sultans of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and then more modern uh, uh, personalities like Saddam Hussein in Iraq, or Muammar Gaddafi uh, in Libya, or many of the kingdoms that exist in the Muslim world and outside the Muslim world. So these are tyrants. Uh, th these are not people chosen uh, through bay'ah, uh, through uh, voting and consents. These are dictators. And a dictator can only be a dictator if they are arrogant. In, in what sense of arrogance? In the sense that they feel, they truly believe, that only they can rule. Nobody else can rule either, except them, and then their kid, and then their child. A male child and so this type of arrogance that leads to tyranny to ta'ud, uh, to controlling uh, a nation uh, and controlling the resources and controlling the people is based on arrogance and so for this and many other reasons the Quran is extremely keen very strongly emphasizing to avoid arrogance. In Arabic, uh, the term takabbur or kibar or kibriya uh, is, is, is the uh, uh, closest equivalent to the term uh, arrogance in English. And so if you are arrogant, you are willing to push and shove people. If you are arrogant, you are willing to uh, go outside the line and try to get in first. If you are arrogant, you uh, run and rush to uh, grab food when it is being distributed instead of waste, waiting uh, patiently. If you are arrogant, you do not uh, follow the rules of the road when you are driving, and many other examples. There are professors who are humble, and there are professors who are arrogant. What is the sign of an arrogant professor? The sign of an arrogant professor who says, everything I say is right, 
uh, and you cannot uh, criticize me or contradict me or say anything different than what I say. This is arrogance. Uh, this is not a proper Islamic behavior. Uh, a truly humble professor will say, what I say can be right or wrong, and what you say can be uh, more right than what I say. And what any student says can be the truth, while what I, the professor, say can be falsehood. This is one of the signs of a humble professor. And all teachers should be uh, humble. And you know that as parents, as teachers, uh, as scholars, a requirement in the Islamic tradition of being a scholar, a teacher, an imam, a leader, one of the major requirements is humility, humbleness, being willing to say, I am not representing 100% the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I am a fallible, I am a human being, I am a fallible being. Allah created me uh, with the condition that sometimes I am right, sometimes I am wrong, I make mistakes, uh, sometimes I uh, do the right thing. That is the nature of humanity. And that is why humility is essential for human beings to cooperate, get along, uh, be civilized, and uh, enrich their civilization and culture. So we can have confluence where the religion and the culture emphasize humility, or we can have divergence where the religion is saying, be humble, don't be arrogant, but the culture is accepting or allowing or promoting arrogance. Any culture, any uh, society that tells you you have to accept a tyrant or a dictator or a king is emphasizing arrogance. And any culture that is saying we should have cooperation, we should have understanding, uh, we should be the ones choosing our leaders, we should have bay'a, uh, which is uh, the Arabic word for uh, choosing a leader. Uh, this is based upon uh, humility rather than arrogance. When we do our rituals, when we go to the masjid to pray, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us not to be chaotic in the masjid, right? We know very well, you line up. First, the first line behind the imam. So the imam has to be in front. Uh, and then you have first line, second line, third line. And then uh, you have men in one place and women in the other. Uh, unfortunately, some masjids uh, prevent women, which is a problem. Uh, or what you can do in some masjids is have uh, men on the lower floor, women on the upper floor. Or what you can do in some masjids is uh, have uh, men on one side and women on the other side. So the imam is in the middle, uh, and then you have women here and men here, or the opposite. So there are different configurations. But uh, a masjid that promotes humility and understanding and peace is going to allow everyone to come into the masjid to pray and to benefit and to worship and to uh, practice humility. Okay, uh, any questions so far about anything we have discussed uh, today in class? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Dr. Bashir. Uh, it was very interesting, all the points that you have uh, made. Very, very uh, interesting. So, I want to, uh, there's two things that which I want to point out. Number one was that uh, celebrating the, the pilgrims who returned from Mecca. In Yoruba tribe here in Nigeria, is something that we love to do. I thought that it was Yoruba that were doing it. So now, because of the issue of Abidia, 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 so that thing is going away. But it makes her, it gives her a, 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 a special special looking to the extent that everybody wishes to go to Mecca. Before they were going, they will call ulama. The ulama will pray, they will recite the Quran, they will pray for sip, okay, for for a sip trip to Mecca and coming back, you understand? And then when they when they return, so the 
they are going to, it's going to be a ceremonial something to the extent that we are going to take a special clothes for it. And probably that that person will go to much could go to Juma with a lot of people to the extent that uh, a few a few gone to Juma, so no, I haven't go, I don't go out to until you go to Juma. So in, in, in the, uh, about 70, 80, early, early 80, 90, but they're still doing it, but in major town, that tradition is no more being uh, practiced. That is the interesting area. Another one that you mentioned is you call it fatal, is it fatalism? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that is very common among Muslims. <laughs> very, very common. <laughs> so, so, Muslim, so Muslim, they behave like a stupid. <laughs> Everything, they will not give it to God. I see that Allah has nothing to do. It is that they want to be taken care of. The one issue I want, to, I want to raise, that issue of giving back to many children. And why are you giving back to many children? Why are you, why are you querying me? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you God? Is it God who is going to take care of them? Ah, can you tell me where the, the, the schools that God builds and where the angels, they are the teachers there, and you go to that school without paying cover? <laughs> you know? <laughs> By the time you are trying to correct them, they use your sayings, use your sayings. Some of them, some of them, some of them they, they will be thinking, if it is possible, they can say it. Uh, I, I, maybe God will help me to come and sleep with my wife. You understand? So everything we have handed over to God. God should do this, God should do that. And I say, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala wants us to use our brain, as well as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a lot of things that they will never talk about it. Because Allah knows you are human being. In the Quran, Allah says, Allah wants us to use our brain. You, you know your income is, is minimal. Like so, you know, we have ulama here. The ulama, they don't, nobody pay, nobody pays their salary. They don't collect salary, they don't, they don't collect anything. They're just working for Allah. They depend on charity. They will be asking people to come and give them charity. And this ulama, they will marry two or three wives. They want to follow sunnah. Okay, the, four, the one wife that you marry, is not, is not a sunnah. What are you going to call that one? So they will not give back to a lot of children. They will not be able to cater for. This thing is very rampant in another part of the country because everything, they say God, 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 everything God. So as if that God has nothing to do again, it is you that God is going to be taken care of. So when you are trying to educate them, you will now be saying that you don't have Iman. I remember vividly some year back, I was talking about raising a, a, a sensible number of family, raising like two, two or four, I suppose four children. Somebody was now looking at me as, as if that I didn't have Iman. Ah, oh, it's quite unfortunate. People don't have Iman again. Say, okay. For me to show that I have a man is to go and be producing a number of children that I will not be able to cater for. In Nigeria, there is a there is a gap between the Christian and the Muslims. You understand? The Christian, you know, the 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 the, 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 the colonial master, the evangelists, they brought the Christianity to Nigeria, and they have educated them that it is very expensive to raise a children. So please. So they follow that thing. That is why in most schools, in all the universities, in total institution here, you have a larger number of Christians than Muslims. But the Muslims, they, they believe in marrying two wives, three wives, they believe in giving back to many children. They don't think about how to take care of those children. They didn't know that it is part of Islam to take care of your children. But they believe that just be given back to children. You see the Imam, they would tell you, continue to be giving back to children, continue to be giving back to children. The Prophet Sallam said, uh, salam. Salam. Eh? You, you, you give back to a lot of children that you know your, your income cannot even take care of you alone. What, what kind of job are you doing? So this is very interesting that you have raised. That is the fatalism, I mean. Fatalism. So that thing is common among Muslims. <laughs> so fatalism will rely on God, everything on God, 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 God. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that what they call Tawakul? 
That's not the way of, of doing tawakul. You have to consider your capability before you go ahead to do something. I say you have to plan. Allah will execute your plan. If you don't plan, Allah will not be to execute anything for you. Allah has given us brain that you think so before you want to do something. So very interesting. Yeah, Allah tabaka wa As you have said again, that there is Islam, there is Muslim. I used to tell people, as you have mentioned, Islam, Quran, Hadith, that is Islam. But Muslim, we behave differently. We follow our whims and caprices. What suits us, we follow it. But what does not suit us, we, we, we stop it. So we, we are behaving like a hypocrite. Certain things we follow, certain we, we drop it. So it is not good. Third one is the issue of uh, lack, uh, 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 not having regard for the rules and regulation. Come on, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> when you go to the north, in the northern part of the country, in Nigeria, you see that in there. <laughs> so you see them, uh, this is a zebra crossing. You don't recognize zebra crossing in Nigeria. Eh? And then, like you have mentioned, you are going this way, you want to turn left, you move, you, you, you will be following the right, uh, uh, right lane instead of you to be following the left lane. So, and then there is a, a, a traffic light. They will never follow traffic light, especially in Lagos. They, <laughs> they, I don't know what's wrong with us. May Allah guide the woman. We have a lot of, a lot of way to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> Barakallah, Fik. Thank you so much uh, for uh, this valuable uh, contribution. Uh, and it is uh, uh, truly uh, and uh, wonderfully essential. Yes, uh, Brother Abdul Jalil, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, I'm very sorry. Please, I joined late. <laughs> I was just from the mocks. <laughs> Welcome. So, I don't know what you are discussing about. <laughs> I, I just came now. Sorry. Yes, we, we've had uh, many topics, uh, particularly the, the contradiction between religion and uh, culture especially in terms of following the rules and uh, being organized uh, and uh, treating everybody with respect. Okay, okay. So what I can say about it is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent each and every messenger to warn his people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, wa ma if I could remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there are two messages. Two messages. First message is, uh, You should worship Allah. You don't have any worthy of, you don't have any deity worthy of worship except He, the one who deserves to be worshipped alone. And the second message is, you should, uh, you should keep your culture, your tradition, your inner self, your inner desires, your whims aside and follow Sharia. So this means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want each and everyone to follow his whims or his culture. Keep your culture aside and follow Sharia. That was the mission why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets. All the prophets came speaking different languages to their respective people. And the only prophet that came to the entire world was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He came to confirm the message of Moses and the other prophet that came before him that they should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he alone and keep their cultures, their traditions, their whims, their inner selves and desires aside and follow Sharia. So that's what I can say about it. So I'm I'm saying uh, sorry I came late. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for that co contribution, uh, Omar. Please. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ah, this class 
it's quite interesting. I really enjoy it. And uh, and in this class, uh, uh, in fact, I understand, I have understood a lot of things from your explanation. Uh, I made to understand that the uh, there are some things that are uh, that are that are cultural in nature, and there are other things that are religious. So, regarding the issue of uh, uh, some people that do go to Saudi Arabia to perform uh, uh, to to steal or to or to go for begging. Uh, in fact, in our in our country, there are some people, there are some men and some women that are financially born, that are financially sound, that sponsor some criminals to go to, so, to, 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 go to the Holy Land. And before they uh, go there, they sit down and make a contract, contractual uh, agreement between them so that, for example, now in our country, if you are to go for Saudi Arabia, you have to pay like three million naira. So, so these kind of people, they sponsor criminals. They sp take them there to 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 do picking pocket, picking pocket, picking pocketing, to steal there. Uh, if they pay like if they pay them uh, six, three million in return, they have to pay back like sixty million. And they, sometimes they even sponsor like uh, uh, cripples, handicaps, those who they, they have uh, lost their limbs to go there to for begging. So all these uh, things are antisocial behaviors. They are injurious to the societies. Uh, uh, in fact, it is not good. Uh, it is it is strictly against the Islamic uh, the, the, the Islamic law. Allah, and Allah says. Uh, and these people, they contribute uh, build in committing something that is antisocial, that is kicked against the, uh, the religion. So the, this is what I have to say. Uh, yeah. uh, may, may Allah bless you, Brother Omar Musa, and you are absolutely correct. Uh, we... Um, yes. We are facing some social problems in the Muslim Ummah. Whether it is a rich Muslim country or a poor Muslim country, it doesn't matter. Every Muslim society, every Muslim country uh, is facing a variety of social problems. And uh, it is very sad to say that these social problems are increasing in every country and in every society. Uh, now, there are good things happening, and there is development, that is true, and that is wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the social problems are getting more and more serious uh, and more and more uh, difficult to handle. So, <clears throat> there are many efforts to deal with social problems by the government, by the religious authorities, by community leaders, by nonprofit organizations, and that is good and important, uh, but it is not always enough and it is not always effective. And one of the biggest issues in all the world, the Muslim world and the non Muslim world, is if you assume that the politicians, uh, the political leaders, will solve uh, the social problems, uh, then uh, this is actually based upon uh, uh, a major misunderstanding. Politicians, no matter how good they are, some are good, some are not so good, but regardless of their intention, uh, politicians are not trained to solve social problems. Politicians are usually lawyers or uh, some kind of uh, leader uh, or uh, maybe uh, political scientists uh, or kings uh, or princes. Uh, nobody trained them or nobody really provided them with and understanding and uh, the skills and abilities to solve social problems. They can talk about it and they can keep uh, making it an issue and raise it in the media, but it doesn't mean they can uh, solve it. So what we have been facing in the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world is some attempts 
by governments, by politicians to solve social problems. And what happens is instead of solving the problem, it makes it worse. Uh, and I will give just one of many examples because we want to discuss this uh, in our classes uh, in the coming uh, two months. The United States, the richest country on earth, has millions of poor people. There are millions of poor children, poor women, poor men in the United States of America, which is the richest country on earth. It is the richest country in human history. It has more money than Allah has given to any society on earth, no matter which society you look at. In addition to more power, in addition to more uh, technology. <clears throat> but let's look at the issue of poverty. So the US government in the 1940s made a decision. They said, uh, we know how to solve poverty. We will get rid of the problem of uh, poor people forever. And the way we will do it is we will take money from the rich people through taxes and we will give lots of money to the poor people. So we will register the poor people and give them money. Especially mothers uh, with uh, children, single mothers with children, uh, people with disability, uh, people who don't have jobs. There were all kinds of programs that were made to give millions of dollars to the millions of poor people. What has happened since the 1960s when these programs began? It has been uh, <clears throat> 60 years. The number of poor people in the United States has increased tremendously. All these programs that the government made to reduce poverty had the result of increasing poverty. So rather than solving the problem or keeping the problem at a certain level, it totally increased the problem. And yet what the politicians say is, oh, we know we, are, we have poor people and we should give more money to poor people by taking it from the rich people. So you see, this is the political way of thinking. They assume they know how to solve a problem. Usually it is solved by taking money from people who have it and giving it to people who don't have it. But in reality, it is a disaster. It is a complete failure. Uh, and so we cannot rely on the politicians. So all the problems you mentioned, Brother Omar, are very important and very critical and need to be addressed. But if we assume the government will solve it, we are very mistaken. So what we have to do is we have to rely on other institutions of society, the economic institutions and the social institutions. And here we are talking about families and schools and uh, religious groups uh, who, if anybody can solve these problems, it is these groups. But the solution will be not, not be cheap, not be easy, and not be quick. It will take a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of effort. But it has to be our own money, not forcing other people to give it and then uh, returning it to those who uh, we believe are uh, eligible for it or should be uh, giving it to. That is why zakat, one of our pillars of the faith of Islam, is not based on the government. Zakat is based upon every Muslim who has giving it to others Muslim and non-Muslim who don't have. Yes, Brother Abdul Jalil. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Mm, yeah, sorry to put you, please. <laughs> uh, you remind me of something. I, if I, uh, I remember the two verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about uh, this, what you are saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. ما أفاء الله على رسوله من أهل القرى فلله وللرسول ولذ القربة واليتامى والمساكين وبن السبيل كي لا يكون دولة بين الأغنياء منكم 
wama atakum rasul fa khuzuhu wama nahakum anhu fanto i will interpret let me go to the next verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa iza aradna an nuhlika qaryatan amarna mutara fiha fa fasaqu fiha fa haqqa alayha al qawlu fa damarna tadmira tadmarna hum tadmira an the first verse says ma afa allah ala rasulihi min ahli al qura the beauty of war the beauty of war you can cut the audience so the beauty of war you earn from them is for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first palillahi wali rasuli is for the rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam wali zal qurba for your near relatives wali yatama wal masakin wa bani sabil for the abilities persons with disabilities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kai la yakuna dulatan bainal aghin ya min dum merit to be to be to be something which you will proud of if you are a richer person don't give zakat or don't give sadaqa to a richer person give it to the poor don't make it like a competition if you are a richer person don't give zakat or don't give sadaqa or don't give anything let's say for example money to a richer person you should give it to a poor or to a person with disability don't make it a competition don't compete whatever the prophet brings it to you you should hold it you should do it whenever he he asks you not to do please you should not do it uh that is the interpretation of the first verse the second verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa iza aradna an nuhlika qaryatan amarna mutara fiha fa fasaqu fiha fa haqqa alayha al qawl fa damarna ha tadmira if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to destroy a nation allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the leaders of that nation the persons of uh the persons in authority the leaders they will commit mischief they will be wicked they will be malicious people they will be wicked people papasa kufiha they will commit mischiefs on dirt earth on dirt nation i mean fahaqqa alayha alqawl fa damarna ha tadmira allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you will have certainty of what we are saying that the the wicked people the malicious people they will commit mischief on that earth because they lack islamic orientation first they lack islamic sharia they lack islamic orientation they lack islamic sharia they lack islamic knowledge they don't know anything about islam they don't know anything about islam they only know the man made law they only believe in man made law they don't fear allah so they will commit mischief allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we will surely show you that those people are wicked and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that at the end we will destroy them we will destroy that nation because the persons uh the purpose uh because sorry i'm stammering i'm stammered sorry because those people that are in that land or that or that are in that nation are mischievous people they are mischievous they are wicked they are criminals so they used to commit many crimes if they uh if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trials them they will commit many crime if they commit that crime allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally will destroy all of them so this what you are saying you are absolutely right those politicians they don't have any islamic orientation they are not after islam they are only after their interest they only love money they only love this dunya luxury life and so on and so forth this and that but they are not after islam they don't like anything concerning islam even if they are muslim 
they don't care about Islam. They only care about their interest. They only care about money. They only care about the life of this world. And if you could remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu mana alayha fan, wa yabuka wajuhu rabbi kazun jalalul ikram. Kullu mana alayha fan, everything on this earth will be fairish. Wa yabuka wajuhu rabbi kazun jalalul ikram. You are Lord, only you are Lord and his. And, 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 uh, only you are Lord and his jurisdiction will remain on this earth. Only you are Lord. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them to the right path. May Allah guide all of us. May Allah give us the fortitude to fatna in all goodness. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Abdul Jalil, for your contribution. And uh, uh, again, you have raised some uh, very critical points. Uh, and what I would like to emphasize here, uh, as you said, uh, throughout history, there have been honorable human beings and there have been dishonorable. There have been people who promote uh, goodness and uh, peace uh, and uh, proper morals. And there are people who promote wickedness mischief uh, and uh, malicious thoughts, actions, and ideas. And this is true for every human being throughout history. There is a continuum being fully good uh, and fully bad or fully uh, productive and helpful uh, and fully destructive uh, and uh, uh, unhelpful. But as we look at history and we look at the uh, negative forces in society, uh, we could have uh, and have had uh, wicked imams, wicked parents, wicked uh, social leaders, wicked uh, singers, wicked uh, athletes, <clears throat> wicked uh, business people. But the most wicked people in history, not all of them, but the most wicked people in history have been the political leaders, the politicians, the people like uh, Fir'aun in Egypt that who was enslaving uh, the Israelite tribes uh, and uh, Sayyidina Musa uh, and his brother Harun had to come uh, to uh, Fir'aun to the Pharaoh uh, and, and the Pharaoh was so arrogant unwilling to uh, change uh, the wicked ways that the Pharaoh was following and so Sayyidina Musa Moses had to take the good people and leave uh, the land of the Pharaoh uh, but the Pharaoh still did not want to them to let them leave peacefully. Uh, he uh, he took his uh, army and ran after them and tried to kill them all. So uh, wicked people uh, are not just hurting themselves, but they hurt other people. And they use everything in their power, all the destruction that they can uh, inflict, to hurt the innocent people, the good people, uh, the victims, uh, the people who uh, are <clears throat> on the side of uh, goodness. Uh, and honor and respect since most the most horrible and the most wicked acts in history uh, have been done by politicians then we have to be very careful about governments and politicians the more power that is given to government and politicians results in unfortunately from our study of history not more goodness but more wickedness and this is very clear from uh, the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and also from human history because Allah required us to learn from history. If you look at all the bad people, all the worst people, all the negative people, all the destructive people in history, the most destructive have been people like Hitler and Stalin uh, and Lenin uh, and uh, Fir'aun and uh, Saddam Hussein and Muammar Qaddafi uh, and uh, uh, Abdel Nasser in Egypt uh, and people like that. So we need to have a culture that recognizes that the government is not the solution. The politicians are not the ones who have the uh, ability and uh, are not equipped to solve social problems. It is not the single dictator leader model 
that will save us. Unfortunately, a lot of Muslims have been told and been accustomed and acculturated to the idea that when there are many problems in society, you need a dictator on top who will then solve all these problems. This has never happened in human history, cannot happen, and will never happen. But until today, many Muslims and non-Muslims will tell you when we talk about the problems in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, or other places in the Muslim world, one of the most common responses is, oh, we need one strong man to come and solve these problems. This is a wrong idea. This is a misguided idea. Uh, this is a falsehood. Uh, this is something uh, that, uh, Brother Abdul Jalil, you have made it clear. What the Prophet has taught, you should adopt. The Prophet never taught us to accept dictatorship, to accept ta'ut, to accept tyranny. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us the exact opposite. We should always adopt peaceful transition and bay'ah, acceptance, voting, the decision of the people through ballots, through elections. That is how the leader must be chosen and elected. Yes, uh, Brother Abdul Jalil. Uh, sorry to cut you. May I say something? Yes. Uh, I just want to tell us something extremely essential. I could remember in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the in the Islam, in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَلْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقُبَلَ مِنُهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ الْخَاسِرِ This verse shows that Islam is perfect. وَمَنْ يَلْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقُبَلَ مِنُهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ الْخَاسِرِ This shows that Islam is perfect, but we are not. So, if we make a mistake, blame it on us, not on our religion. Islam is perfect, but we human we are not perfect. So if we make a mistake, blame it on us, not on our religion. Because we human, we created weak. We are we human, we are the problem of our answer because we are weak. So whatever the mistake we made, blame it on us, not on our religion. Not on our religion. So Islam is perfect. The Quran confirms that. Also, the prophetic tradition confirms that. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Definitely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Thank you very so much. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting and fascinating because it is very common, not just in Islam, but in uh, all religious traditions for uh, people to make this kind of statement that uh, the religion is perfect, Islam is perfect, or uh, in the case of other religions, they will say that uh, Christianity is perfect or Hindu Hinduism is perfect. So when a Muslim says Islam is perfect, one of the most uh, common understandings is that they are referring to uh, the Quran. So Allah is perfect and the Quran, the word of Allah is perfect. Anything after that, which is human, cannot be perfect by the statement of the Quran, uh, Allah telling us that humanity, as you said, is weak and fallible. Any human, uh, no matter who they are, is liable of uh, being correct and liable of making errors, of making mistakes. So, when we are very clear on the fact that uh, the Qur'an is perfect and humanity is not, then we must be very careful when we are saying what is correct and incorrect. Because human beings who are imperfect are interpreting the word of Allah which is perfect. 
So the imperfection lies in the interpretation, not in the source. And when this is clear and understood by the Muslim community worldwide, then we become humble enough to say that we have been blessed by the miracle of the Qur'an, which is perfect, but we acknowledge that our understanding of the Qur'an is never perfect because we are liable of making mistakes. And so we have to be very careful when making claims about the Qur'an because we are making a human claim about a transcendent, godly book. And this is where our imams and scholars uh, and Islamic leaders and da'wah activists have to be extremely clear that when I speak, anybody speaks and bases what they are saying on the Qur'an, the Qur'an remains perfect, but our interpretation, understanding, our knowledge of the Qur'an will always be imperfect. <coughs> and what does this mean? It means that Although Islam, based upon the Qur'an, is an internal religion because the Qur'an is eternal, Muslims throughout history, from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, until the Day of Judgment, are always liable of making mistakes. And so when we use concepts like the Sharia, which is the law of Islam, the Sharia is based upon the perfect document, which is the Qur'an, but the Sharia ah itself, which is a human understanding of the Qur'an, is imperfect and can never be perfect. So the Sharia, ah, which is Islamic law, which is putting into action and rules what the Qur'an says, will always be imperfect and is always changing and adapting to be better. And once the Muslim community understands this, then we can reduce a lot of the confusion. And we can then be able to confront anybody who says that their interpretation and understanding of the Qur'an is the only correct interpretation and people must follow their interpretation because their interpretation is perfect. This is a problematic statement and unacceptable for the Islamic community because anybody claiming perfection for themselves is contradicting the Qur'an. And anybody claiming that their particular interpretation of the Sharia ah or their formulation of the Sharia, ah, the Islamic law, is the only perfect formulation is committing a violation of the Qur'an itself which clearly states that anything a human being says cannot be perfect. Yes, uh, Brother Abdul Jaleel. Assalamu alaikum wa uh, Based on what you are saying, I could remember one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا دِتَّكَ فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Yes. Don't purify yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the best who knows who are fighting amongst you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't purify yourself. Only God knows who is the best among you. So this shows that you are not allowed to show perfection. You are not perfect. But Islam is perfect. But you are not perfect. You can make a mistake. You can make a mistake. You can make a mistake because you are a human being. You are a human being. So you can make a mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't purify yourself. Don't feel so big. Uh, I'm a good person. Uh, I used to give zakat. I used to perform extra prayers. I used to do this and that. Don't say that. Just do it for the sake of Allah. And don't ever feel feel you are perfect that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means don't purify yourself so you can make a mistake Adam alayhi salam if you could remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Adam alayhi salam 
he made a mistake. That was Allah. Uh, that was Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al-Baqarah. If you could remember, he made a mistake. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Don't eat that tree," and he ate it. So he made a mistake. <laughs> he made a mistake. Mistakenly, he ate it. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "I must punish you, but I, I forgive you. I forgive you, but I will punish you." So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you could remember the incident of the son of Nuh alayhi salam, what, 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 what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about it was, Nuh alayhi salam says, inna bani min ahali wa inna wa haq. My son is among my ummah, and you promise me that you will never destroy my ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna hu laysa min ahali, inna hu la amanan gayru salih. He's not amongst you, because he's not doing good things walatas alnima laysa laka bihi illa allah warn him allah says walatas alnima laysa laka bihi inna u'uzuka an takuna min al-jahilin don't ever ask me don't ever because you don't know anything you you are just a prophet but you don't know what i know don't ask me walatas alnima laysa laka bihi don't ask me what you don't know don't say what you don't know you don't know anything about my predestination about faith Maybe it's a fate. You can't change fate. You can't change destiny. So I already destined that he is arrogant. He is recal. He was recalcitrant, right? So don't ask me what you don't know. I don't want you to be among the illiterates because you are literate. So he made a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa taala warned him that don't ask me what you don't know. So, if you could remember Prophet Lut alayhi salam, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the, uh, about the history of Lut alayhi salam, when he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, Oh Allah, my wife, my wife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, she is also included because she was what? She was arrogant. She was recalcitrant woman. So she was among the criminals Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kajalna aliha safilaha wa amtarna alayhim tijaratan min sijil inna fi dhalika la ayatin lil mutawassimin so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them upside down he destroyed them they were being stoned with the fire if you could remember the history so this is about mistakes even the prophets if you could remember and uh, if you could remember Prophet, uh, Prophet Yunus was a nuni is the Haba Mugadib and Fazana Allah Nakadir Alayhi Fanada Fizulimati Al La Ilaha Ilanda Subhanaka in me. What does that mean? In me, Kuntimina Zalimin. Indeed, I wronged myself. He said, La Ilaha Illa, and there is no deity worthy of worship except you, Allah, the only one true God. In me, Kuntimina Zalimin. I indeed wronged myself. So he wronged himself and he made, he confessed. He confessed, yeah, Allah, I wronged myself. He, con he, 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 he confessed. Confessional statement. Allah says, So we what? We answered him. We answered his prayer. We answered his request. We what? We answered his prayer and we escaped him. We escaped him from the uh, darkness of that Red Sea, of that sea. So we escaped him from that sea, from that darkness, from that suffering, from that. Uh, From that suffering, from that darkness. So we answered his prayer. But what but then what did he say? He said, In new Kuntimina Zalimin, I indeed wronged myself. This is the Mahadi Shahi. So thank you very so much. Sorry, I'm stammered. I'm <laughs> stammering sometimes. <laughs> Barakallah, may Allah bless you. Uh brother Omar Musa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
uh, uh, it is uh, quite agreed that every uh, Muslims, every Muslims believe that Quran is perfect and agree that Quran is a book of Allah which reveals abundantly the virtue of action according to the way of Allah. And it is a book which reveals the Prophet Muhammad through, under, through Angel Gabriel for the guidance of entire universe, entire world. Everybody, every Muslim believes that Quran is perfect and there is no doubt about that. But where the problem lies is that when it comes to the interpretation of the Holy Quran. Some, you, 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 you can find many people with different interpretation. For yes. how do you judge this kind of uh, situation? Like people with different opinions, like in the case of uh, uh, Tawhid, for example, Tawhid, let's take Tawhid as, as an example. Uh, you, uh, in your explanation, you made mention that uh, the Tawhid now is divided into three. We have Tawhid al-Rububiya, Tawhid al and we have Tawhid al-Asma'i wa So this is how the Tawhid is divided according to one uh, uh, school of thought, according to some other uh, Muslim scholars. But, but there are other scholars who are looking at at a different angle. They say that uh, Tawhidi, uh, Tawhidi is not divided into three. They, they say Tawhidi is one. They say, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalitu wa lam yulatu wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. So Tawhid, they say, is, is one. Uh, Allah says, uh, say, he Allah the one. He says, it's not the sort of one. Uh, uh, he did not know, not know, he will be gotten and that's not com comparable to him. They say Tawhidi is one. Arabu, they say Arabu, who al ilahu, al ilahu, who al rab, and so they say there's no uh, difference be, be, between that. They say that or uh, nobody, uh, uh, the prophet did not. They say the, the prophet did not uh, divide the tawhid into three during his uh, lifetime. Likewise, uh, his sahaba until during the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, that this issue of the division of tawhid into three came up. So you see this kind of uh, different contra contract, uh, uh, com uh, this kind of contradicting uh, opinion. So uh, as a Muslim, how do you reconcile? How do you judge this kind of uh, uh, views regarding this uh, issue? So how this is my own what I want to find out. Jazakallah uh, uh, khair. This is uh, some key points that uh, you have raised, uh, and it uh, relates directly to our theme uh, of the fact that uh, we begin from uh, one source, the Quran, uh, and yet we have uh, throughout history varieties of understandings, interpretations, uh, and uh, ways of thinking uh, about what is in the holy book. So uh, I would like to wrap up the class by saying uh, that uh, using the example of Hajj, uh, one of the most important Muslim uh, rituals and a key component of the Islamic faith, we uh, are challenged by the fact that our religion requires us to perform Hajj uh, and it was uh, shown, us, shown to us through the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and yet, when we practice it as Muslims, sometimes the result is uh, positive and good and wonderful uh, and exemplary. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are things that occur in Hajj that we discussed in class today that are problematic, that are hurtful, uh, that are negative, uh, that are against uh, the uh, basic understandings of our Islamic faith. And the way to address that, or some of the ways to look at this issue uh, and try to solve this problem, uh, is to have conferences, seminars, gatherings that bring together all kinds of opinions from the Muslim world, uh, the scholars, uh, the uh, scientists, uh, the politicians, the economists, the sociologists, uh, the sheikhs, uh, uh, the Sufi masters, uh, the uh, da'wah leaders, 
everybody needs to be part of a discussion that relates to a problem-solving theme. How can we take Hajj, which is so wonderful, and the implementation can be made even better? We can try to achieve itqan and ihsan, improvement and excellence uh, in this uh, ritual of Hajj occurring every year and required by uh, every Muslim to do at least once in their life. Nothing human beings do is perfect, so there's always room for improvement and enhancement, and it is our responsibility to do it. It is a collective responsibility. So just like in this class, I am always encouraging you, all of you, to participate in the class discussion and ask questions and raise issues uh, and uh, contradict what I say and criticize uh, what is uh, being uh, done in this class so that we together can try to enhance our experience, share our understandings, and all of us uplift each other as a group rather than uh, being divided individuals uh, who refuse to uh, benefit uh, the other individuals. Hopefully, inshallah, what we have discussed in this class has been beneficial. Anything I have said that is wrong or incorrect, I ask forgiveness from the Creator. And anything uh, I uh, and all of you have uh, who have said it, uh, which is good and beneficial and true and positive, I ask our Creator, uh, I ask Allah to bless it and to help us spread the positive ideas and good ideas and the willingness uh, and the uh, push for improvement and excellence in all our lives. May Allah bless you. And until the next class, uh, I will say here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh.